Okay. Um, welcome to today's IBIM seminar. And we are very honored to have invited Professor Graham Taylor from Oxford to give us an interesting talk on the visually guided morphing wing flight in birds. So as usual, I will give a brief introduction of Professor Taylor. Professor Graham Taylor was trained as a biologist and based in Oxford's Department of Biology. Graham works at the interface of biology, engineering, and nature artificial intelligence. His research focuses on the guidance and control of flight in birds, insects, and bats, and its applications to computer vision, autonomous systems, and the design of the built environment. He has a particular interest in understanding how evolution tunes animals to learn and perform complex sensory motor behaviors and works closely with industry and government on bio-inspired applications. So I'll give the floor to Professor Graham and uh, Taylor and uh, let's welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction, Julia. Can I just check the screen sharing correctly now? Yes, we can see it clearly. Okay. All right, so we'll, well, thank you very much for the uh, the introduction and the invitation to speak today. Uh, I'm going to talk today about visually guided morphing wing flight in birds, uh, which has been the, the focus of research in my group for, for some time now, and particularly in the last um, six years or so, on a European Research Council funded uh, research grant on, on visually guided flight in birds and applications across to autonomous systems. Uh, and quite a few of the people that contributed to this work uh, are named down at the bottom of that slide there. So uh, before I uh, forget at the end of the talk to thank everybody, this is the result of a, a huge amount of work by all the people involved and uh, many of them actually joining this talk today uh, and may want to come in a little later during questions. So to just kind of motivate this, um, this area of research, let me just begin by sharing this video of a kestrel, which is hovering in an updraft uh, provided over a cliff in Wales. And you can notice several things going on in the course of this. You can see the, the extensive morphing of the bird's wings that's being used to control and stabilize its flight, uh, that also coupled with motion of the tail. But perhaps what's most striking of all in this video is the stability of the head. And you can see that in effect, the, the bird is uh, controlling all of its motions around that head. It's holding it very stable which of course is important for this uh, as a predatory species, which is looking out for prey on the ground. And so this leads to a number of questions that were focused on and actually links to a very nice description of birds as being a wing guided by an eye, uh, which is a, a useful way of thinking of them from the perspective of their flight behavior. So the kinds of questions I'm interested in understanding and answering are how do birds use vision to guide complex goal directed flight behaviors? And I'll pick up on that extensively through the course of the talk. And to kind of bottom that out a bit, what guidance and control algorithms do the sensory motor systems of birds encode? And how are those acquired through both learning and evolution? In turn, how are those guidance algorithms and strategies optimized in relation to the morphing, wing and tail morphology of the birds? And then in optimization problems that might involve two or more players, so uh, attack and evasion of behaviors, for instance, how are their guidance algorithms and pursuit evasion strategies coupled? So these are some of the questions that we've been focused on for the past few years. And uh, to, to go about tackling these, actually it was necessary to begin by um, creating something that didn't exist already. And this is what's shown here, it's the Whiteham Flight Center. Uh, it's been collecting data since 2017. And what this is, is a motion capture lab uh, built specifically for birds and work with autonomous vehicles. So it's got a set of aviaries on the left-hand side of the building where we keep our flying team of Harris Hawks, which will be the focus of a lot of what I talk about today, uh, and also a colony of zebra finches that I'm not going to discuss so much in today's talk, but that we also uh, work closely on. And the key thing with this facility is that it's enabled us to collect uh, a truly vast amount of biomechanical data. So we now have data on over 25,000 flights, uh, which includes perching, obstacle avoidance, gap negotiation, and pursuit behaviors. And I'm going to talk about all of those in the course of this talk. The key thing to take away from that then really is that this is a, 
a uh, really substantial amount of data that we're able to collect and analyze. And it really takes biomechanics across into the era of big data and changes the ways in which we're able to go about uh, analyzing this. And you'll see some of that through the course of this talk. Oh. Right, so if we switch across to what the lab looks like inside, you can see now the motion capture facility. So we've got 22 Vicon Vantage cameras uh, rigged up around this in this particular case here. And this is one of the simpler behaviours that we look at. So this is perching flight that you'll see from one of our Harris forks. Uh, and the kinds of things that were interested in this, this was actually just the very first of the pilot experiments that we did, uh, which then uh, turned into a much larger experiment, which I'll describe now. Uh, what we're interested in here is understanding the bird's use of vision to guide the flight up to the perch and um, control be used in the control of its braking and so on, but also what it's doing in the course of that flight with its wings and tail. Uh, so that gives an idea of the overall behavior. And then this is the um, this is the paper that resulted from that. So this is work particularly by Marco Klein-Hirenbrink and by Lydia France, who are joint first authors on this work. So what you can see here is that the hawks follow a very stereotyped kind of flight trajectory in getting from perch to perch. Uh, and it involves flying up to the perch. Uh, and you'll see that a lot if you were to look at any large bird uh, and how they get between perches. So the first question that we asked for this really was to try and understand what is being optimized by the bird in the course of converging to that particular flight behavior. And converging to that particular flight behavior, I mean that in a literal sense, because if we look at, across the very large amount of data that's collected, you can see there for, uh, for several hundred flights plotted up as a, a spatial histogram with varying perch distances shown, that the birds end up following uh, very, much, uh, very similar trajectories over the course of time. So the density of the blue that you see on the right-hand side there uh, is a spatial histogram, so that's showing how much time, relatively speaking, birds dwell in those particular points on the graph. And what you can see from that then is that the birds very much converge towards this swooping flight trajectory. So when flying between level perches, as is shown here, what happens is that the birds make a flapping dive, as you saw in the last video, followed by a gliding climb up to the perch. And the trajectories that they follow are very consistent both within and between individuals. Uh, but that, though, is the result of learning. And you can see that here for uh, one particular bird where we were able to track it through the majority of its flights it ever did. So from the beginning flights there shown up in red through to the ones that it had reached after 80 flights, you can see that what happens is that the birds, when they're naive to the task, flap directly between the perches for the first few flights and then very quickly learn to swoop up to the perch. And since they all end up following broadly similar learning trajectories, and since that's something that falconers also observe when they're training their own birds, so they'll fly flat between uh, when flying between two falconers' fists, and then very quickly learn to swoop, it suggests that there is, in all of these birds, some common objective function against which they're optimizing that flight trajectory. Uh, and what we were interested in was to find out what that was. So to analyze this, we started from a very simplified aerodynamic model, uh, which assumed constant lift and power on the two phases. Uh, and when we look at this, we can look at what would seem the two most natural hypotheses. First one being that this swooping minimizes energy expenditure in the course of flight between the perches, or alternatively that it's to do with minimizing time. Uh, so the birds want to get from perch to perch as quickly as possible, for instance, because they are gonna get a food reward when they arrive. And in nature, at least, food uh, may be a fleeting, uh, fleeting thing. What we find instead, though, is that where this transition occurs from flapping to gliding flight actually minimizes the distance from the perch at which the birds stall. And um, that's what's shown in the lower one of these graphs. And I need to explain in a bit more detail now what's, what's shown by the different lines, because at first sight, it can be a bit confusing. So the flight trajectory that's predicted under each of these three alternative hypotheses is the one that's shown up in the gold and blue. If you can see my cursor, I'm not sure if you can, then it's uh, tracing the line at the top, uh, which is a relatively flat and level flight. And that's what you would do, in fact, it turns out, if you're minimizing energy. If you're minimizing time, you would take the gold and blue trajectory that's uh, shown in the middle plot, and if you're minimizing the distance from the perch at which you stall, you take the trajectory shown here. And as a way of summarizing those trajectories, what we then do is define the transition point between flapping and gliding as the key point in this. 
And so the position of these crosses on the gray line, that's a line of optima uh, varying the, uh, the extent to which time or energy matters, uh, or looking at the importance of uh, minimizing stall, which is what's shown by the middle of the three crosses. What you can see from that then is that the only one of these three hypotheses that predicts the overall character of the swooping trajectory is minimization of the distance from the perch at which the birds stall. And that I think makes some sense because uh, as a bird stalls, it loses control authority. And if you do that too early, uh, the inevitable result of that is that you need to flap. So that does in turn then end up playing into the amount of energy that you require, but it also contributes something to the safety of landing uh, and the overall control authority that you have as you land. Now, what we then did was to look at this in a bit more detail. So look at the exact position of the transition point that we measured across many different flights. Uh, and that's what's shown up the distribution of those by those, um, those Gaussian kernels that you can see there on the right. And the cross on each of these is marking the prediction of where the transition point should have been according to the model uh, for each of the individual birds. What you can see on that, if you look at the scale, is that the match between the model and the predictions is very close. I began by saying that this was a very simplified model. It assumes constant lift and power. What we then did was to relax the model's assumption and to show that the residual variation in lift and power that the birds actually displayed brings the stall point even closer to the perch. And so what we think then is that this provides a uh, both insight into the objective function that the birds are, um, are optimizing with respect to uh, in the course of learning their perching behavior, but potentially also something that will be of interest in reinforcement learning of perching in drones, uh, where the trick to getting this to work properly is very much to do with uh, choosing an appropriate objective function. So that hopefully gives some insight into how we start thinking about these problems, but that was very much the, uh, the first of a whole set of analyses. And a lot of the work that I'm going to be presenting now uh, is work that's either uh, currently in submission or uh, about to be submitted. Uh, so what you're seeing here uh, for the remainder of this section, at least, is, is mainly unpublished work. So in addition to looking at the overall flight trajectory, we also, of course, measured what the wings and tail were doing. And you can see some of that on the right here. So these plots, which are, if you like, almost fingerprints of an individual bird and of a, not just of an individual bird, but of an individual bird in a particular kind of flight configuration, whether that be flapping or gliding or landing as part of that perching sequence. What we've done there is to track markers that are at different points along the wing. So you can kind of infer from those plots looking forward where they are. So we've got some towards the base of the wing, then other ones out here, one at the wrist. And in the course of flapping, what you see are these kind of concentric shells, which are because the wing is, of course, flapping around on a, a more or less constant radius. And that gives the paths that are a trace there looking, uh, looking from behind the bird. If we look from the top, then we get a slightly different view on that. And then this third orthogonal view is the view from the side. And one of the interesting things with these fingerprint plots, actually, is they already show some individual differences in the gait that the different individual birds use. So just as humans humans have very distinctive walking gates, so too do each of our individual hawks have very distinctive flight gates. But what we were interested in doing was really going from this to looking at how morphing wing flight is controlled. And one of the first things to point out there really is that because the entirety of the wing of the bird is a morphing surface, in a bird we don't have the discrete flaps that are used as control surfaces in uh, most, um, most engineered systems, uh, and most engineered vehicles. Instead, you've got a continuously deforming surface, and that then begs the question of what the underlying uh, space is in which the bird can operate from the perspective of its control. So in other words, what the control inputs are. Now, we haven't yet got to a final answer on exactly what the control inputs are that the bird has available to it. But what we have been able to do is to describe a, a vector basis for describing the, uh, the kind of control subspace that the bird operates within. So this is really uh, a description of the range of different motions that the bird can use to control that perching flight that you just saw. And the way that we've done that is by uh, running a principal components analysis. Um, singular value decomposition effectively on the, on the data. And what this allows us to do then is to identify a set of uh, characteristic motions that when coupled together are what describe the bird's flight. So because of the nature of this analysis, the first of these principal components, which is the one at the top left, is the one that contains most of the information. 
Uh, so you can see that's the up down flapping motion, which just reflects the uh, the extent of the wings, uh, the wings excursion really. And then as we progress through these uh, lower, uh, these higher numbered principal components from two, three, four, five, and so on, then we find the other components of the motion that are important to the bird's motion. Now, something you may have noticed already if you look at this is that none of these is a in itself a natural motion. So the first of the principal components has the wingtip moving more or less vertically up and down rather than on the radius. And it very much is the coupling of these together with the kinematic constraints that defines what the birds can actually do within the space that this uh, set of principal components defines. But it provides a very useful and important first step for decomposing the different motions that are available for morphing wing flight in these birds. And to show just how useful that can be, if you look at these different videos down here at the bottom, these are using varying numbers of the principal components to describe the bird's flight. So this is one actual flight from one of our birds. And all of them look uh, broadly quite similar. They also look very bird-like in what you're looking at there. But what I want to emphasize really is that there are just four control inputs that are being used in that plot on the left there. So it's already capturing the coupling of the wing and tail motions uh, in relation to how the body is moving. And as we move up to increasing the number of principal components that we use, obviously then the fidelity with which we're able to describe the, uh, the motion increases. And you can now see what's happening as the bird is coming up to the perch at the very end. And so the way to look at this then is it provides a way of doing dimension reduction in the data. So we go from what is a very complex motion in the way that the wing moves to being able to summarize this as just a relatively small number of different inputs uh, that then allows us to describe what the bird is doing. And so the next steps in this really are to, to make use of this then to provide a model, uh, not just that describes the kinematics of the birds, which is where we've got to at the moment in the paper that's in prep, uh, but also to use that as a, a vector basis for describing the control of morphine wing flight. We've also been looking at this in the context of various other behaviors. So this is uh, wing morphing being used for gap negotiation. I'm not going to explain this experiment in detail today. Just suffice to say that the movement of the gap is important to the design uh, because it allows us to, to modify things in a way that isn't strictly predictable to the bird. Uh, so it's not necessarily able to predict where the gap is going to be at the point it transits it uh, and therefore needs to react to the gap's motion. But one section I will talk about is, is what happens when a bird's trajectory is interrupted by the presence of an obstacle, and um, particularly what happens if that obstacle is moving in a fashion that makes this an unlearnable kind of motion. So if we go back to that basic swooping perching motion, what we've done here is to make the task a little more difficult for the bird by now putting a horizontal bar in the way, and in addition, moving that bar up and downward as the bird is approaching. And what that means is the bird has a binary choice here. It can go over the bar or it can go under it. And of course, the exact trajectory it takes will depend to some extent on where the bar is, but that binary choice of going over or under uh, is essentially what we're exploring here. Now, the reason that this is particularly relevant, initially I was interested in this from the perspective of what we could learn from how birds avoid collisions uh, in terms of autonomous vehicles. But actually, without going into the detail, it turns out that one of the most interesting things that comes from this moving objects like turbine blades, which you see shown over on the left here for a griffin vulture soaring around a wind turbine. Uh, this is a, a set of frames that we've put together into a composite image from an actual video uh, of a collision with a wind turbine, uh, which shows the lack of any avoidance or evasion response at all on the part of the bird. One of the things we're interested in is how we can use the insights from this work on moving obstacles to inform wind turbine design to try and minimise that kind of occurrence. So what we started looking at then was to predict the uh, behavior of the bird, just in terms of whether it went over or under the bar as the very first and simplest level of analysis. So this is a statistical analysis facilitated by being able to collect data over many hundreds of flights. So a very simple model in which we model uh, whether the bird passes over or under the bar in relation to the height of the bar at a particular moment in time and the speed velocity of the bar and then also control for the identity of the individual birds. So just to kind of talk through the, uh, the overall implications of the model, 
what it shows is that if we um, if we look at the um, at the regression coefficients that come out of this, what we find is it's more likely that a bird passes over a lower bar. Well, it's not surprising. That's what we would expect. Uh, but if we look at it in relation to the bar's velocity, what we find is it's more likely that a bird passes over the top of an ascending bar. So in other words, if the bar is going upwards, the bird is actually diverted to go over the top of it, which in the context of wind turbine, the same behavior were happening there would lead you into the danger zone in relation to the turbine blade. So that's why the work is relevant in that way. So at first pass, then it appears that the obstacle negotiation strategy of the bird actually increases the collision risk in relation to a moving bar. And at that point, it's probably worth pausing and saying that this is, a, of course, an artificial kind of stimulus. This isn't one that you would typically encounter in the, the natural environment, where the kinds of motions that you would experience are, are typically oscillatory motions of a branch or, or something of that nature. So it's perhaps not surprising then if a, a behavior that works perfectly well in the natural environment doesn't work well when you start putting in uh, difficult tasks like a, a bar that's moving in one direction. Now, what we then did was to, to look at this in a bit more detail and to look at the uh, impact of the bar's state on predicting what the bird would do at different points in its flight. So the result on the last slide there is uh, as the bird is passing over the bar, but if we now go through and look at what happens going back through time or, or rather distance to the bar, then we can build the same model uh, and look at different distances from the bar at the impact of the bar's height and the bar's velocity. And what you'll notice is that the overall best prediction accuracy of the model is quite flat over a range of about five to three meters before the bar. So in other words, if I know what the bird is doing and what the bar is doing between five and three meters before the bar, that gives me the best ability to predict whether it will go over or under it. So if we now want to think of this in terms of the point at which the bird makes a decision, it's probably around four to five meters ahead of the bar. And if we look in a bit more detail at what the model actually shows, then what we find is that that moment in time where we get the best predictive power of the model coincides with the point at which the height of the bar has the strongest of predictive effect. So that's shown by the strength of the regression coefficient, which is what the graph at the bottom is showing there. Uh, and if you notice at that particular point, you'll also see that the regression coefficient for the velocity of the bar is around zero at that point in time. So in other words, the point in time or distance from the bar at which the information about what the bar is doing gives us the best ability to predict what the bird will do, that's about four and a half meters before the bar. And at that point, the most informative thing to know is the height of the bar. So it's almost as if the bird is disregarding the bar's motion at that particular point in time, uh, which is an interesting result, I think, and then explains why if you then carry things forward to what the bar is doing at the point the bird actually goes over it, leads to this uh, problematic kind of behavior. Now, we've also been analyzing that in a bit more detail now, taking this back to the Theme that will form the, the next chunk of this really, which is looking at the role of vision in guidance, which is to look at the different ways in which the bird can see the bar. So we compare here, for instance, the elevation angle, which is just the, uh, the angle of the line that you would draw from the bird to the bar that it's going over or under relative to uh, the horizontal versus the deviation angle, which is the angle between the line to the bar and the bird's velocity. And what happens when the bird's flying under the bar is that in that case, it doesn't really interrupt very much the natural typical sweeping behavior. But if the bar is in the way and the bird decides to go over the top of it, then it greatly modifies the bird's flight path. And if you look at the graph on the right there, what you'll see is that it seems to be holding the deviation angle close to zero uh, for that period of time that we identified as being a critical period around four to five meters before the bar and a bit to either side of that. So to kind of simply by what that graph means. In effect, if the graph is hovering around zero, it means that the bird is directing its velocity at the bar, and actually more specifically at the top of the bar. So it's as if the bird is actually targeting the current position of the bar at that particular point uh, in its flight. And it's that that then causes the bird to, uh, to be lifted upward and to go over the top of the bar if the bar is ascending. So this has given quite a lot of insight then into how birds respond to obstacles, not just stationary ones, but also moving ones. We've also been looking at this in the context of different kinds of obstacles. 
Uh, and so what you'll see in the course of these uh, videos that I'll show now is some reconstruction now from the perspective of the bird as it's doing those tasks. So rather than abstracting things into a couple of angles that describe where the bird is looking, what you'll see now is uh, a, a, effectively what would happen if you were to put a camera on the bird. So we'll start off by pretending that the camera is put on the bird's back, in essence, and uh, essentially points in the direction of its flight velocity. So this is a, a rendering using a, a video rendering engine based on where the obstacles were in the lab and what our measurements show of where the bird is looking, uh, or rather where it's moving in this particular case. And what you'll see through the course of that then is the bird coming in to land on the perch. Now you might have noticed some oscillations in the course of that video, which is because the gaze is, or rather the bird's body motion is not perfectly stabilized. So what we now do is play this back, but now do it from the perspective of a camera mounted on the bird's head. You now see a much more stable uh, kind of flight behavior there. And if you notice what the bird is looking at in terms of what's at the center of its visual field there, it seems to be looking at the edge of the obstacle consistent with the results of that last study, but then looking in at the middle point of the perch as it comes in to land. So this was work by Sofia Mignano Gonzalez. Uh, who's a PhD student in the group, just finished and now moved on to UCL. And what we've done here then is to use that same kind of spatial histogram approach as I've shown you already once or twice, which is what's made possible in part by having this very large amount of data. And so what's plotted on these figures now from the perspective of a camera mounted on the bird's head is the contour of either the perch or the obstacle that it's getting around. And so the bright red or green on that shows you where the perch edge or the, where the perch itself or the obstacle edge is spending the most time in the bird's field of view. And what you can see very convincingly is that on the right hand side there, uh, the bird is really fixating the edge of the obstacle most of the time in the middle of its field of view, whereas in the case of the perch, it looks at the midpoint of the perch. So this is helping us to understand the bird's gaze strategy as it's negotiating these obstacles. Now, the other kind of behavior we've been looking at, though, is a different kind of one. And I'll bring this back in a second to relate it back to obstacle avoidance. But this is now a pursuit behavior. So another use of guidance by these birds. So this is now a hawk chasing after a remote control car. Both of them are carrying a, a GPS, which is accurate to a few centimeters. And in the case of the hawk, we've also got measurements of where its head's looking. Uh, so this is now work by another PhD student in the lab, James Shelton, who's just finishing up at the moment. Uh, so here we're interested in understanding both where the bird is looking and how it's steering its flight through the, the course of that pursuit. Um, what I want to do now is just kind of flick back to some slightly older work that we've done on this, uh, which then provides a nice introduction to the latest work that we've been doing with the Harris Hawks. So this is another kind of goal-directed behaviour, and, and everything that I've talked about so far is chosen as a behaviour where we know exactly what the bird is trying to do in terms of its overall goal. So the overall goal of a perching bird is to perch safely, even if we might want to ask detailed questions about what it's optimizing. Likewise, the overall goal of obstacle avoidance is not to hit uh, obstacles in the environment. Uh, and uh, that then enables us to, um, it, that kind of approach enables us to, uh, to be able to study these behaviors because we know exactly what the bird is trying to do. And the same way, it's very obvious in the case of a, um, a flight after a target, what the bird is trying to do is trying ultimately to intercept the target. Now, when you do that, uh, you find that when you look across the attack geometries of different animals uh, and look across uh, different uh, species, you find that in many cases, the geometry that they follow resembles something that's known as a parallel navigation course. Um, I just need to explain for a moment what this means because it becomes relevant later. So if we've got our pursuer uh, shown down there is the gray silhouette flying along the blue path there, and the magenta is the target that it's, uh, that it's intercepting. This magenta line is called the line of sight. So that's just the line drawn between the target and the pursuer. And what you find is that in the final stages of an intercept, typically those lines are parallel. Now that actually makes good sense because you can also infer from the geometry of this plot that that's a necessary condition for interception if two things are moving in a straight line. So if you're, if you're moving in a straight line towards one another, uh, the line that connects them will remain approximately parallel through time uh, if you are on a collision course. 
And so that's something that uh, sailors and mariners are taught to do, uh, taught to recognize, to identify when a collision is about to happen. Now, in the context of actually deliberately causing a collision to happen, which is, of course, what you're trying to do in an interception behavior, then this kind of geometry is what you want to produce because that is what's going to end up leading to a, uh, a collision. And this is typically implemented in engineered systems, such as uh, guided missiles, using a guidance law that's called proportional navigation. And so what this is, is a kind of feedback law, similar to a control law, uh, which in this particular case here means turn at a rate that's proportional to the angular rate of the line of sight to the target. So the line of sight to the target is that magenta line on the left there. And essentially what you're doing is you're measuring the rate at which the direction of that line changes, and you're then steering in response to that according some, to some constant of proportionality, uh, which is called N there and it's referred to as the navigation constant. And if you look at that, you can see that what that is going to do is to drive the, uh, the line of sight angle to being constant because this behavior actually serves to, uh, to kind of zero out the line of sight rate if things continue moving in the same way. And it doesn't actually do a bad job if things don't continue moving in the same way. So if your target's maneuvering, it's not a bad thing to do either, although there are better ways of steering your flight if the target is maneuvering. So what we did was to go out into the field and look at peregrine falcons chasing after uh, maneuvering and stationary targets. Uh, so we had a, a model aircraft that they were chasing in this case, or a uh, bit of food that was being thrown to the ground. And to measure using our GPS units, the trajectory that the bird followed. And what we find from that is that the trajectories that they follow, particularly after stationary targets, follow a very kind of characteristic uh, family of curve shapes. So you see these curves which are of decreasing, uh, radi uh, sorry, increasing radius, so straightening out as they come into the final approach. And that family of curves is rather beautifully modeled by the proportional navigation guidance law. So what you're seeing on here with the dots is the GPS measurement, and the blue is the model that is fitted to the data. So we've allowed one degree of freedom in the fitting between each of those different plots. So we've allowed the guidance gain to vary. Uh, we've done that fitting to two different uh, lengths of flight on each of those plots there, uh, which is a kind of sensitivity analysis. But if you focus on either of the blue lines, either of those tells the same story generally, uh, which is that there is a range of fitted values of this navigation constant, so the, the guidance gain in this guidance law. And that range of fitted values is somewhat lower than we use in guided missiles. Uh, which actually makes sense for, for various reasons to do with the optimization of that, to do with having lower flight speed and probable higher sensor error. But that same basic guidance law that is implemented in guided missiles turns out to do a very good job, actually, of modeling what peregrines do in flight. Now, if we go across and look at a few other different birds, we find that gerfalcons, which are another species we've looked at, do something quite similar, but they're tuned somewhat differently. So the beauty of this is that it allows us to really look at complex behaviors, uh, but to look at them uh, by summarizing this using quite a simple, uh, simple form of guidance law. And that then allows us to take a comparative approach to looking at the guidance of pursuit behaviors. So we can compare the guidance gain across different species. What we find typically is that birds that hunt out in the open or insects that hunt in the open tend to have higher values of this navigation constant. And ones that hunt in clutter like Harris hawks do uh, tend to operate with a lower value. And this actually makes some quite nice sense because operating with a low value of this guidance gain and specifically operating with a gain of one actually leads you into a kind of tail chasing behavior. And if you watch this next video through, which is now in the flight lab again. Sorry, I don't know whether you uh, caught the <laughs> commentary on that video there or the awful noise of the lure. What you're seeing there is that the bird is entering into a kind of tail chase after that target being pulled around the lab. And it's also doing that, though, at the same time as having that target chasing behavior put into conflict with the obstacle avoidance. Now, the kind of setup that we've got there, it's actually not a bad thing to be in a tail chase, because if your target is also avoiding the obstacles, chasing after it and following the trajectory that it followed will lead you between the obstacles rather than into conflict with them. So that already makes some sense of why the guidance gain might be at that 
uh, lower level. But it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that. And so what we've done here then is to do that same kind of approach to uh, guidance law fitting now from the data from the motion capture lab. Uh, and so if we simply fit more or less the same guidance law as I was describing, actually with a slight modification here for the peregrines, if you fit that across to the Harris Hawks and ignore the presence of the obstacles altogether, it already does a pretty good job of capturing the bird's flight, which is what the lower set of panels there are showing. So in this particular case, the dark blue is the bird's actual trajectory that we measured, and the light blue is the bird's trajectory uh, that is predicted by the model. So when there are no obstacles present, which is the top set of panels, you can see that the model does a very good job of describing that. And when you look at the lower set of panels, you'll see that the presence of the obstacles causes uh, some uh, differences between what the model is doing, certainly by the time you reach the second set of obstacles towards the top of the graph. I'm going to perhaps whiz over these two slides quite quickly because um, uh, just keeping an eye on the time. But what we find with this is that the way in which the bird seems to be dealing with the conflict between the obstacles and being able to chase the target is that in addition to kind of continuously tracking after the target it's chasing, it also seems to be throwing in a correction which leads it to go between the obstacles. So again, there seems to be a decision point uh, a few meters before the obstacles, similar to what we found before in the case of the, the moving bar experiment, where if the bird is heading towards the obstacle, it puts in a correction and ends up flying around to the side of it, but all the while it's continuously uh, gu guiding its flight. i have also then used that to look from the perspective of the bird at the um, what the bird would see during the course of these behaviors. This is a slightly different experimental setup now. Target is that orange thing that's moving around. And the black thing there is a curtain that was hung in the middle of the lab. This again is looking from the perspective of the bird's head and the red and the blue parts of this are outlining the extent of the visual field of the left and right eyes. So you can see there, perhaps not surprisingly, that the bird is looking directly at its target. You may also have noticed as it went around the curtain that it was looking at the curtain edge. So we're beginning to build up a picture then of how the bird's gaze strategy allows it to implement that top level guidance behavior, which is the one that I was just describing. Now, one of the issues with this kind of approach is that although we can use the motion capture system to measure where the head is looking, we can't measure exactly where the eyes are looking. And so if the eyes of the bird move much relative to the head, then what we would find is that those reconstructions would be inaccurate. So this is some work done by James Kempton, who's another PhD student in the group, uh, looking at trying to, uh, to see how far the eyes move relative to the head in flight. So what we've done in that video there is to get very high definition video uh, and to use that to be able to uh, see what the eye is doing in the final stages of this pursuit behavior. And if you look at the frames on the right, although this has proven extremely difficult to quantify uh, in practice, there appears to be very little movement to the eye relative to the head, at least in these final stages of a pursuit. So that substantially validates the approach that I just showed you of treating the direction of the head as if it's telling you where the bird is looking. And as I think I forgot to mention already, uh, Caroline Brighton was the postdoc whose work, uh, the pursuit flights after Harris Hawks and in Peregrine Falcons, that was all her work uh, that I was just describing in the section before. Now, thing I've shown you in those analyses from the motion capture lab, of course, is done in a confined space and it's done after artificial targets. And if you really want to uh, push a, a bird to its limits, then ultimately you have to take it out into the field and ultimately you have to have it in its natural state of chasing after prey. So as you're watching this video here, which is some work we did out in Scotland, looking at peregrines chasing after grouse, we do need to explain in this that we're not influencing any way what happens with these birds. We're observing existing hunts. Uh, and so this is just us videoing uh, these behaviors and not having any impact on it which is relevant from the perspective of the ethics approval on it. And what you'll see through the course of this is the um, astonishing ability of the, the peregrine to maneuver and swoop down on its target. Also, what's a pretty impressive ability in some of these are the grouse to evade, um, evade attack. If you didn't already know about stooping, well, this is where a bird uh, dives down almost vertically, but you might also have noticed that it's flapping in the course of some of those there. And so we were interested, among other things, in understanding why the birds choose to stoop. 
uh, because uh, among other things, it leads to the need to pull out as the bird approaches the ground. And you'll, you'll see some of that in this, this video here. So the bird's coming down hard towards the ground. And then you can see there that it has to pull out, which is a challenging task aerodynamically. It's gonna um, slow down as it does that. Uh, and then the grouse in that particular case was able to evade at the end. So this was work done uh, both by Caroline Brighton, who I just mentioned, and also another PhD student, Robin Mills, where what we were trying to do with that then was to go from these kind of measurements that we've done of what peregrines do, making use of the GPS or those kind of videos that I was just showing you there, and use that to get into a uh, greater depth of understanding of the guidance behavior. And so what I'm going to now do is to flip across to a kind of computational approach to this, uh, where what we've been doing is building a computational model of a bird that allows us to then look at the evolution of that behavior uh, through genetic algorithms. So what we do in this block diagram here is we've got a model of the bird's dynamics and control. I've referred already to some of the aerodynamic challenges that are associated with those kinds of tasks. But we also have a model that incorporates what we know about the bird's vision and also a block in this that relates to the bird's guidance that picks up on those earlier studies where we effectively model a proportional navigation guidance law. So without going into all the detail of this, the black box has a very complex aerodynamic model in it, which is picking up the uh, details of the wing's flapping motion and how that's optimized. But at the end of all that, what it produces is in effect a lookup table where you can look at uh, what your maximum for a given load factor uh, and a given airspeed, what your maximum forward acceleration is that you can achieve. So in other words, this is building up the physical constraints that uh, underpin your behavior. I'm not going to go into the detail of that uh, on account of time, but essentially what it shows is that in order to be able to get the maneuvering that the peregrine needs to intercept a target like the Starling, it needs to be flying at high speed. Um, that, of course, relates to the fact that the aerodynamic forces on the wing uh, scale with the bird's speed or the speed squared. And what we're able to do then is to evolve uh, different kinds of behavior where we start the attack from, for example, a different altitude. Uh, and what's shown on these plots here, those yellow crosses or stars, those are the optimum place from which to start an attack, where the vertical axis there is your altitude and the horizontal is your horizontal starting distance from the prey. And what you can see is that particularly as the prey starts maneuvering, being higher up to start with, so at the top of those plots, where the yellow cross or the star is, that's the best place to start. So in other words, it makes sense to stoop. And what's happening here is that by stooping, you're building up the speed that enables you to get the very high load factors that you need to maneuver and to maneuver in an agile fashion with your wings drawn in. Now, the video I showed you before was really just there to illustrate the behaviors. But what we also do with this is to quantify the behavior. So we have cameras set up in the field that allow us to reconstruct in 3D the flight trajectory of the bird. What that then allows us to do is to compare model predictions from, say, the evolved model falcon across to what the birds actually do when we then go and look at them uh, in the field. And so this comparison here is between the real falcon. Uh, so one of those stoops that you saw in the first video shown up in the blue there. And the green is the result of one of these models, which is instantiating what we know about how the, uh, how the birds do the guidance in flight but that has also been optimized against, um, uh, against the task in hand. And you can see that there's a discrepancy between the models towards the end of the attack there, uh, which relates to the fact that actually we didn't have the constraint of the ground in the, in the learning that the model was doing. And so the absence of the ground, uh, ground plane in the model means that the bird in the model isn't forced to pull out in the way that the one in the blue is. Uh, so that kind of failure of a model to predict a, a feature of the data is actually uh, one of the things that makes modeling approaches informative. It shows you what you need to incorporate into the model to add realism. But in addition to evolving the attack behavior, we're also able to evolve the evasion behavior. So we also have a model of the grouse uh, that builds in what we know about its aerodynamics and flight mechanics, and are able to evolve the agent that is the grouse in the model in a way that means that it is able to optimally evade in response to uh, the optimal behavior of the attacking model peregrine. What we find there is that the model predicts more or less the same behavior as we observe in the real grouse, which is that the birds jump from side to side. So it's called a jinking behavior, very common in evasion behaviors generally. 
uh, and is both what the model predicts and what the data shows. So the final bit that I'm going to talk about on this just takes things now to one last level on the guidance of uh, attack and evasion behaviors, which is to start thinking about some of the other ways in which animals avoid being caught. So one thing you can do is to avoid being caught by uh, doing a kind of evasive behavior, as we just saw. But another thing that many animals do is to make use of safety in numbers. Uh, and you see that here for swarming bats. So these are Brazilian free-tailed bats um, uh, or Mexican free-tailed bats that are uh, emerging from a cave in New Mexico. And out waiting for them are these Swainson's hawks, which are diving into the swarm. And what you can see from that then is that these hawks are accomplishing the same kind of task of catching a target, but they're doing that in the context of the confusion of a massive swarm, uh, which is of many possible targets that the bird could be attacking. So we just watch through this and see what the birds are actually doing in the course of this. There's a slightly closer up view of it that you'll see now. Uh, so you've got the hawk coming straight into the swarm there. Um, what it will appear to do as it flies on through is to swoop in and then just to, to grab a bat from the swarm. What we then started doing was by being able to track those bats using videogrammetry and the, the same way as I showed you for the data out in Scotland from peregrines, was to be able to uh, track the three-dimensional uh, attack trajectories of the hawks flying into the bat swarm, and then to try and model that using the same kind of guidance algorithms that I've described already. So what happens if we throw proportional navigation, the thing that peregrines and guided missiles do, at this particular problem? Well, we've thrown it at the problem in two ways. One is to track the bat that it ends up catching and to treat that as if it's the target. And the other one is to ignore what the bat was doing and just treat its final position as the target of the bird's behavior. And what we find is that the data are much better modeled by ignoring what the individual bats are doing and just treating the final position of the hawk and the bat as the target of the bird's attack. And when you do that, what you find uh, shown up on those plots there is that very nicely, the proportional navigation guidance law actually does quite a good job of modeling the bird's approach behavior as it's flying towards what is in effect a fixed point in the swarm. So in other words, to solve this problem of dealing with a very large number of possible targets, what the birds seem to be doing is effectively targeting a fixed point in the swarm, or perhaps more generally just turning on a constant radius into the swarm, and then rather than chasing after any one individual, selecting a target that they're on a collision course with that they can then go and grab. Which raises the question, how do you manage to select a target from what is a very complex picture with a moving swarm? And what we find is that if you look at this, this takes us back to that parallel navigation geometry that I talked about before. If you draw the line in the video images that we take between the hawk and the bat that it ends up catching, you'll see that very nicely those lines are parallel. And if you recall, that's because things that are on a collision course for one another remain on a constant bearing. So that's exactly what you expect. Uh, and so if you're diving into a dense enough swarm, chances are that there will be at least one bat which you're on a collision course for, and that bat is by definition gonna remain on a constant bearing. And what that means is that when you look at the swarm, if you're a stationary observer like we are stood at the edge of the bat cave, you see the confusion of everything being in movement. But if you're the hawk that's plunging into the swarm, what you actually see is that the targets that are the ones that you're already on a collision course to hit are going to appear stationary against the movement of the rest of the swarm. And so in terms of how hawks may be able to simplify this problem from a sensory processing point of view, although a swarm looks very confusing if you're standing still looking at it, when you're plunging straight into it, the part of the swarm that you're actually going to hit is going to appear to be approximately stationary. And that, we think, explains why it is that the hawks are able to achieve what is otherwise a very difficult task, and in fact, show no decline in their ability to catch bats when they're swarming compared to when they're flying individually. In fact, if anything, it may be an easier task for a hawk to catch a bat from a swarm than it is um, for it to catch a lone individually flying bat. So I've whizzed through quite a range of different goal-directed behaviors there, but what I hope it's shown you is that we're really beginning to understand bird flight behaviors at a level that can inform rather than merely inspire the design of flying robots. Uh, 
I've hope I've shown you that we're able to look at various different biologically relevant control inputs. So things like kinematic couplings of the morphing of the wings and tail, but also of output observations that will be important to autonomous systems or to the, the birds themselves. So things like the line of sight rate, it's important to the proportional navigation guidance law and the things that then connect between these. So what's being used to command the control affected by the wings and tail in the first place. And combined with the ability to collect big data over what is tens of thousands of flights, this also op opens up a very new and exciting possibility, which I hadn't really foreseen at the start of all this work, which was to understand not just what birds do, but also how they learn to do it. And so what I want to conclude then is to, to say that I think the, the idea of understanding how birds and other animals learn to fly uh, is really the next frontier for this research. So I've tried to pull out the various people involved in this as I've gone through and talked about the, the work, uh, but if I've forgotten anybody, they should all be on this, uh, this bit here. So it just remains for me to thank again all of the many people that were involved in this work, um, you for your attention, and the European Research Council for supporting almost all of the work that you've seen today. So thanks very much for your attention, and we've got five minutes for questions at the end. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Taylor. Is there any questions? So, is there anyone got any question? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Professor Graham Taylor have showed us a, a lot of as aspects uh, of the things. So I I'll have a question. Um, when you talk about the how the birds trying to um, tr trying to go across the bar and when the bar is moving, so uh, do you say that its strategy basically well well guide its collision into the bar uh, rather than avoid it? So I, I don't quite understand about the. So it, the birds don't hit the bar in that particular case there. So the bar is moving slowly enough that the birds do avoid it. And in that particular case, the bird's behavior, if the bar's going up, let's see the video that now, then if the bar's going up like that and the bird's approaching, what the bird will do is fly over the top of it. It still choose now, to uh, fly over the top rather than avoid but the point it. is that it, so yes. that's why so I think if you, the yeah. line is, uh, is going faster enough, then the bird will collision. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So so if you've got a if you've got something that's moving too fast for that behavior to to yeah. work well, then yeah. it's going to be highly problematic. So that's what we think is going on with the wind turbines and the, the collisions I there. See. Um but obviously the sensible thing to do if you really were predicting where the bar was going to be at the point you go under it is to it, or the point you reach the bar is if it's going up, you go under it. But the opposite turns out to be be true yeah. in the bird's behavior. I see. Yeah. Basically, but it makes sense in light of the guidance. Yeah. So is there any...